I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May, when uh, much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. First stage engines, which will give us the lift off, has indicated a go for launch. Launch operations manager Paul Donnelly also giving us a go for launch. And finally, the launch director, Walter Capri, and says we are go for launch. We've passed the five minute mark now and swing arm number nine. This is the access arm to the spacecraft is coming back to the full retract position. It moves back alongside the mobile launch tower and it will remain there now through the final portion of the countdown and the launch. At the T minus 60 second mark, 20 nozzles will start flame deflector deluge of 13,000 gallons per minute of water pouring down on that flame deflector. So a great deal of what is seen at launch time, which looks like smoke is actually steam as this water is burned off, this water to cool the pad area and to cool the equipment uh, alongside of the uh, launch tower as the water also pours across the swing arms in the launch tower. We're approaching the four minute mark in the countdown now. T minus four minutes, five seconds and continuing to count. At the four minute mark, we'll stand by for a final go from Norm Carlson, the launch vehicle test conductor. He's given a go. The uh, launch operations manager now switching over to the uh, Astrocom circuit. This is the circuit that the astronauts, the launch operations manager, and the uh, spacecraft communicator will remain on. They uh, have this private circuit to keep extraneous talk off of their circuit. Uh, they, are, they are checking in. They are checking in now on the Astrocom circuit, uh, indicating that they are go. Spacecraft has indicated they are ready. Instrument unit uh, ready light has come on. S1C, that's the first stage. Preparations are now complete as we approach the three minute mark. There's quiet in the firing room now as the engineers and technicians are monitoring their consoles. They're monitoring the various rates, pressures, temperatures. They can override the terminal sequencer if they uh, cite a problem that it has not picked up. We are on that terminal sequencer now. We've passed the three minute mark. T minus two minutes, 47 seconds and counting as we are on the terminal sequencer. At the T minus 50 second mark, we'll be looking for that critical power transfer. This is where we transfer from the external power source, which has been feeding the three stages of the launch vehicle, to internal power, that's to the flight batteries uh, aboard the space vehicle. It's expected that uh, given proper weather conditions, people will be observing this flight from as much as 500 miles away. This includes a large portion of the southeastern United States, the northern tip of Cuba, and the Bahama Islands. Now approaching the two minutes, two minute mark. Mark, T minus two minutes and counting, and the countdown continues to move along smoothly. Now in the uh, terminal countdown portion, the automatic sequencer has stopped the replenishing of the liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen. We're standing by uh, now to begin pressurization of the fuel tanks, the second stage fuel tank pressurized, third stage fuel tank pressurized. The countdown continuing to move along smoothly, T minus 90 seconds, T minus 90 seconds, countdown continuing smoothly, S4B propellants uh, pressurized, the indication now using the workaround showing the S4B propellants have been pressurized. Now looking at the liquid hydrogen tanks as uh, they become pressurized, LH2 aboard the second stage pressurized. All propellants now aboard the second stage pressurized as we approach the one minute mark in the countdown. Mark T minus one minute and counting now in the final minute of the countdown. At T minus 45 seconds, Gene Cernan will make the final guidance alignment. This is the uh, mark, T minus 45, and Gene Cernan made that final guidance alignment. That's the last action taken by the crew aboard the space vehicle. Now approaching the half minute mark, T 
T-minus 33, T-minus 30 seconds, and continuing on now, continuing on at the T-minus 26 second mark, T-minus 25. We'll get a final guidance uh, release at the T-minus 17 second mark. T-minus 17, final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. 2, 1, 0. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. downrange, eight miles high, and the velocity appro approaching 3,000 feet per second. Looking great. Stand by for mode one, Charlie, 17. Mark, mode one, Charlie. And the flight dynamics officer says we look good on all sources, uh, right on the trajectory. Roger, 17, you're go. Flight director Gene Kranz taking a status for staging. We say we look good for staging. Roger, we're going here. Inboard cut off. Roger, inboard. Inboard engine shutting down on time as planned. Crew will experience maximum G-forces of about 4 Gs uh, at shutdown. Coming up on first stage shutdown. And we've had shutdown on time on the first stage. Five. Roger, they're looking here, looking good. Sure felt like it. I think we saw them all from here. Roger, Jack, and the thrust is going, all five of them, they're running good. Okay, three minutes in, we're go. Roger, 17. Okay, we do have skirt step. Roger, we confirm skirt step. There goes the tower. Ah, there she goes. Roger the tower, you're mode two. Roger, mode two. Steering has converged and CMC is go. You're going right down the pike, 17. Okay, Bob, I do confirm guidance. That's the automatic guidance system, the inertial guidance system performing properly. Breakers and uh, we've seen it all. Ignition, uh, staging, and tower. Roger, got you. Okay, we're all 17, now 65 miles high. Okay, four minutes and we're go here, Bob. Roger, Gene, we're going around the room. Let's go here. You're looking real good, Gene. Right down the line.
Okay, 430 and we're still going forward. Roger, 17, you're go. Let me tell you, this night launch is something to behold. Coming up on five minutes, so everything still looks very good in the launch of Apollo 17. The launch vehicle spacecraft now 80 miles high, 230 miles downrange. Uh, 94 miles high and uh, about uh, 211 miles downrange. Five minutes Velocity 8,079 miles an hour. Uh, that's okay, five minutes into the flight. Fire. And we can still see them right there on your screen. They're still uh, visible with the naked eye from the Cape here as a, about a first magnitude star. And whoops, it looks to me like uh, there are clouds somewhere came in between up. our uh, high magnitude camera and, uh, and the, the spacecraft. So that's probably the last view we'll get of it. They might pick it up if that cloud is a narrow one. But uh, by that time, it'll be just another dot in the sky. Among the stars and on the way to the moon, Apollo 17 delayed for two hours and 40 minutes. The first technical delay in all of the Apollo program, but now a beautiful and highly successful launch. Everything went uh, exactly as planned. The uh, space uh, agency will make up the time uh, by a uh, alteration of the firing of the trans uh, uh, lunar uh, injection uh, a little later on in this morning and from there on out the timeline will be right back to where it should be. CBS News coverage of the flight of Apollo 17 will continue in a moment. At an altitude now of about 92 knots. It all started 25 years ago. When Bell Laboratories invented the transistor. Science fiction was soon to be fact. Three, two, one. Men would walk on the moon. And we would see them. Computers would become almost human. Music would be carried in your hand. People would be kept alive. Thousands of phone calls would go over a single cable or through the air. And over these 25 years, Western Electric helped by inventing ways to make transistors by the millions to bring you better telephone service. Western Electric. We're at the heart of the Bell system. We make things that bring people closer. Apollo 17 is finally on its way to the moon and a most successful launch. Let's take another look at it, at the videotape of that launch uh, just seven and a half minutes ago. Ten, nine, eight, seven, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. Two, one, zero. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. Downrange, eight miles high, and the velocity 
Appro approaching 3,000 feet per second. Looking great. Stand by for mode one, Charlie, 17. Mark, mode one, Charlie. And the flight dynamics officer says we look good on all sources, uh, right on the trajectory. Roger, 17, you're go. Flight director Gene Kranz taking a status for staging. We say we look good for staging. Roger, we're going here. Those are kind work. Well, that was the spectacular scene we saw just 10 minutes ago. And while we were watching uh, that scene played over again for all of us to exult in it, uh, we got uh, the critical word from space that uh, the S-4B third stage, where they'd had the trouble this evening and caused that two hour and 40 minute hold, worked perfectly. It uh, fired off uh, just at the moment that it was planned to, uh, in the force that it was planned to, and now the spacecraft is well on its way toward orbit. At this moment, it's 108 miles high, 973 miles downrange, and traveling at 16,260 miles an hour. It'll be up to uh, its orbital speed of 17,500 miles an hour very shortly, and about a little over 11 minutes into the flight, it will uh, have achieved orbit. Everything is going going perfectly so far, and there's no reason to expect that uh, that orbit will not be achieved. Communications with the spacecraft have been perfect. Here is Bruce Hall. He's with Charles Smith. He's a 130-year-old former slave who came to this country 118 years ago. He's here for the launch of Apollo 17. Bruce Hall, come in. We have here among the VIPs one very unusual man. He's at least 130 years old. His name is Charles Smith. And do you believe it really happened? You said they would never go to the moon. No, they ain't going there. I'll tell them that. And then the border's going to leave it. I said, no, there ain't no border going to the moon. No. What are they going to stop uh, up there? What's going to hold that plane up in there? What is going to hold it up there? The moon ain't going to hold it. Oh, they've been before. There's a bunch of money. Oh, of course, I don't blame them from getting it. Just like when, when the first man killed the president, the first president that was killed, Guitar killed Garfield. There's something he had him. I brought him back. He said, bring it dead alive. I got him. They brought back rocks last time when they made a trip to the moon. Do you believe that? No. <laughs> no, ain't nobody been there. You don't no. believe they've been no. to the moon? No, no. no. Ain't nobody been there no moon. Well, Walter, that's the view of a 130-year-old man. Now back to you. Well, Bruce, uh, Charlie Smith is not the only fellow who doesn't believe that man has gone to the moon. It's not as ridiculous a thought as you, would, as you might think or any of us might think. It seems a little bit odd now, but uh, I've talked to a lot of people around the world and uh, some rather intelligent ones who uh, somehow or other uh, just cannot accept the fact and, and believe that uh, that uh, man really hasn't done it, that somehow or other it's a big hoax. I've uh, found them many places. I don't know, maybe you have as well, Wally. And uh, it, it really isn't, uh, it really isn't anything uh, that unusual. Right, right at this moment, uh, we're about to get uh, the word that they're in orbit, and let's, uh, let's find out now as we listen to Mission Control. Well, here's Vice President Agnew. Let's go to him for a moment. Members of the Apollo launch team on this 11th consecutive successful manned Apollo launch. I'd also like to extend best wishes to the mission control team and the recovery team and, of course, the crew of Apollo 17 for a totally successful completion of this mission. A lot of people seem to believe that this being the last Apollo marks the end of our space program. That is not the case. We hope that this will be only the beginning of more extensive explorations of space and the use of the great collateral information that comes out of it. We know that we have coming up the exciting Skylab program, which involves four launches next year, one unmanned and three manned. 
Uh, we know that in 1975, we're going to go forward with the Apollo Soyuz rendezvous mission. And we hope that this is a forerunner of increased cooperative efforts in space where great nations may draw closer together through constructive use of their capabilities. Also, we look forward to the space shuttle, uh, which opens up infinite possibilities for increased capability in this kind of travel. And for the development of all of the science and application systems that have begun so advantageously for the world. And so I extend my congratulations again to each of you for the work that you have done in making the Apollo program such a success. And to those of you who have worked with Apollo so effectively at the close of this particular stage in our space program, I extend our thanks for your determination and your dedication. While we were waiting uh, for this trouble to be clarified and rectified, I was impressed by the tremendous care that was taken to make certain that no one was placed in a position of jeopardy, to make certain that everything was correct before we went ahead. This is the kind of care and dedication that you've brought to your work. And for this, the nation and the world respect and admire the American space program. Again, congratulations and best wishes to you all. That was Vice President Agnew, of course, as he addressed the men in the firing room and launch control center here at uh, Merritt Island at Cape Kennedy. Uh, after the launch of successful launch of Apollo 17. The man in the uh, blue shirt uh, there is Kurt Debus, uh, who is the director of the Kennedy Space Center and who has uh, supervised the launch of all of these Apollo missions. The astronauts are now successfully in their Earth orbit. They're in an orbit 107.5 by 102.9 uh, statute miles. That uh, was to have been a circular orbit at 107 statute miles. So they're uh, very close to uh, the orbit that they wished. They could tweak that up a little bit if they wanted to and put it directly uh, on uh, target, but that probably won't be necessary. The error is so small. And uh, now uh, their uh, next uh, big uh, mission, after getting into orbit successfully two and a half hours late, uh, is uh, comes along at uh, 3.44 in the morning, or 3.30. 34 this morning, uh, that uh, three hours and 21 minutes into the mission when they will fire off uh, their S-4B engine again and start on their trip to the moon. That will be on the second orbit around the Earth out over the Atlantic. A little later on in the morning then, an hour and uh, so after they go into their translunar coast, uh, they will dock uh, with the S-4B, separate from or turn around dock pull the lunar module out from uh, its uh, shelter on the top of the S-4B, send the S-4B on its way to crash into the moon, and they'll be on the way to the moon. To arrive at the moon on uh, Thursday, or rather on Tuesday afternoon, uh, they, um, I was correct, that Monday afternoon, they arrive at the moon at 2.55 p.m. Eastern time. There will be three walks on the moon, Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, our time, of about seven hours each. They start back to Earth on Saturday at 6.31 p.m., and their splashdown is some 400 miles southeast of Samoa in the Pacific on Tuesday afternoon, the 19th of December, and plenty of time for them to get home for Christmas. What a Christmas will be for this family after a year and a half of intensive work on this mission, most of the time spent away from home on training missions, and now they'll be back with their families. Their mission completed successfully, we're all expecting. We, uh, we just uh, know that it's going to go that way. The excitement of this launch uh, has been absolutely uh, right up to what we all expected, I think. It was a spectacular sight. We have heard from our old friend of the police chief of Miami Beach, Rocky Pomerantz, however, that it was not visible from Miami Beach, uh, strangely enough. We would have thought so from here. It certainly was visible at Cape Kennedy. 
And Wally, we got a buffeting here tonight, uh, such as I don't think we've had since that first test of a Saturn V. Uh, we really were shaken in for a very long time. Yeah, I was quite surprised. Uh, I think it may be the humidity, but I'm not sure. That was, uh, it was yeah. a real shaking we had. It uh, certainly was. Uh, some of those who were standing outside of our staff around here, my secretary, Carolyn Dorsett, was outside, and she said it didn't seem as great as it was in the past to her, but it sure was in here. That window shook, and the ceiling uh, shook on us, and, uh, and it, uh, it was uh, very exciting right here. Well, now we've got them uh, on the way to the moon. Commander Eugene Serman, Navy captain, 38 years old, veteran of two space flights and uh, two space rookies. The lunar module pilot who go to the surface of the moon with him, Dr. Harrison Jack Schmidt, a geologist, uh, 37 years old, and uh, the spacecraft commander who will remain with the command module America, Ron Evans, a 39-year-old uh, commander in the Navy and a Vietnam veteran, the first one to go into space. They're on the way to a point in the moon and the upper right hand corner as you look at that moon uh, in the northeast quadrant that would be an area called Torrance Littro, a mountainous region southeast of the on the rim of the Sea of Serenity and uh, there they hope to find perhaps the oldest and the youngest rocks on the moon and that's why they're going to that uh, particular area. The uh, uh, area is dangerous. Some say it's the most dangerous uh, spot, although others think that 16's high peaks and boulders might have made it a little more dangerous. The landing site here is not as rugged as the actual landing site for 16, that is the terrain itself. It's a valley, but it is between three massifs or three mountains running up to 7,000 feet high. They've got to clear those and come in for a on-target landing. It's expected that they'll make that. Uh, there hadn't been any reason to indicate in previous flights that they should have trouble with it. The cost of the mission, $450 million, putting the total cost of these manned missions, this is the sixth landing of nine trips to the moon uh, at uh, something over $25 billion. So Apollo 17 on the way. Of course, uh, CBS News will be following the mission throughout. Uh, we will have our CBS News Space Center uh, in Houston and in New York uh, tuned in to the the every development of the mission and come on the air at any time that it seems necessary and at some set uh, schedules later on of the high points of this flight of Apollo 17. President Nixon has sent his uh, congratulations to Apollo 17. He said it's a great step for man and uh, certainly I think all of our viewers and all of us at the CBS News would send our congratulations along too. This has been uh, a report of the launch of Apollo 17. Captain Wally Shira participating with me, I'm happy to say. Uh, this is Walter Cronkite at our CBS News Space Center at Cape Kennedy. Houston, uh, that's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you.